Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Chavan, Mrs. Tracy Metz, Mrs. Anne Swartzen, Mr. De Luca, and Mr. James Kennedy. Mrs. Chavan, we are very happy to welcome you here in The Hague and congratulate you on your book on the axis of good and evil, originally published in Dutch under the title Op de As van Goed en Kwaad. As the director of the John Adams Institute, it has been a challenge to organize for the first time in the history of the John Adams Institute an evening about a book written in Dutch. And I must conclude it's a big success because the evening is sold out. On the Axis of Good and Evil is a very well written book and an easy read, full of colorful anecdotes illustrating tough topics. Over the years, Mark Chavan has met a huge range of people, from the president of the federal court in northern Alabama to Minister, Minister Ted Haggard, president of the National Association of Evangelicals, the MoMA director Glenn Lowry, and Secretary of State Colin Powell. His vast personal experience is precisely why he can offer so many new insights on American society, economics, and politics. Written from the perspective of an outsider looking in, it is a must read for Americans and non-Americans alike. Tonight's moderator is Tracy Metz, writer and journalist from NRC Handelsblad. She will introduce Mr. Chavan and lead the panel discussion after the lecture. Mr. Chavan is besides a writer, a former correspondent for NRC Handelsblad in Washington. He is now a professor of journalism in Groningen and still writing for NRC. Um, our panelists for tonight are Anne Swartzen, senior editor of Bloomberg News in Paris. Thank you for coming, especially to The Hague, for this event. Really, I appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Thomas Luca, a professor in political science from Fordham University, who currently holds the Thomas Jefferson Fulbright Chair in American Studies in Amsterdam. I heard you speak for the first time in The Hague on your new book, Demonization and the End of Civil Debate in American Politics. And thank you for accepting this invitation. Mr. James Kennedy, a professor in contemporary history at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, welcome here as well. An all-American panel, it will be interesting to hear your comments later tonight on the book of Mark. After uh, later on, the audience will have a chance to ask Mr. Chavan and the panel questions. Uh, before I hand the floor over to Tracy Metz, I will be back uh, to let you know about getting your book signed and about our upcoming lectures. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us here at this exciting event. Need I introduce Mark Chavon? That seems like very much the wrong way around. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to say a word uh, at this very special moment when Mark's new book has appeared. I remember talking about it with him on the phone when he was working on it, and he was living in Berkeley at the time, which is, uh, we all know is one of the most beautiful spots in California. And he said, well, I don't see anything because I'm sitting here writing with the curtains shut all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt for you, I'm glad the curtains are open again, that you've come back to Holland and that the book is now actually here. The book we are here to discuss this evening is what we might call a small cultural guide to the U.S. And it is a book that touches me personally, both as a journalist and as a citizen, both of the Netherlands and of the U.S. The title itself is a double-edged sword, you might say. Op de as van goed en kwaad, as of good and evil. I think it reflects very well the ambiguous feelings that many of us here in Europe and in Holland um, feel when its uh, deeds and its nature and its um, importance to us as a country and to a continent is at stake. I myself have just come back from a visit to the States where I will be spending the coming academic year as a fellow at Harvard. Having just read Mark's book when I was there, I was so struck by the many, many things that to me as an American living in Europe, are so intensely familiar, so recognizable, and yet at the same time so foreign. Reading this book is like having a curtain pulled away from before your eyes, or maybe better yet, cobwebs. In that sense, it is also quite confronting. 
In some ways, reporting on the U.S. as a correspondent for a small European country is a lousy job. No one ever returns your phone calls. Everyone thinks you're from Scandinavia. <laughs> and you never get to speak to any dignitary except in a pool of several small countries or maybe even large European countries who have joined forces to force someone in uh, a position of importance to confront the European press. But what is maybe even worse, and we never stop to think about that here, is that your readership at home here thinks that they know everything already. The tricky thing is that it all looks so familiar. Every European who goes to New York for the first time thinks, oh, it looks just like the movie. <laughs> What the Europeans don't know is that every time Americans come to Europe and see a castle, they think, oh, it looks just like Disneyland. <laughs> Here in Europe, we see things American all the time, in the movies, on TV, in books, talk shows, you name it. It is so familiar, we think, that we no longer really see how different it truly is. Americans are more energetic than Europeans, more gung-ho, more in-your-face, if you will. They, we, are also more radical in their convictions, in their religious beliefs, in their drive to improve the world and less embarrassed about doing so and saying so. Mark's mission as a journalist was to show us the reality behind our preconceptions, to show it what it really is like there, to show us that Americans are not as one-dimensional and as simple as they can seem to European eyes. He poses the difficult questions. We Europeans can stand by and be critical, even cynical, with regards to America, but what are we doing to help the world? How long can we stand by with our, pocket, our hands in our pockets and watch? America has been amazingly successful in the past two centuries. It has transformed itself from what was essentially a dusty wagon train into the world's strongest, perhaps most capable, perhaps not, superpower. This urge to go to extremes, be it in religion or in politics or in body mass index, <laughs> This manic lifestyle where more is never enough, all this harks back to the pioneer mentality. America has undergone, undergone some profound changes since then, in the past two, in the past, not only in the past two centuries since the wagon train, but certainly in the past few years and certainly since 9-11. In his book, Mark distinguishes four major areas where change has been nothing short of revolutionary. Foreign affairs, the economy, religion, and the media. We'll go into these later in our discussion with the panel. Some say, <coughs> some say the U.S. is now over the crest, plunging down on the other side as it wages a war that many feel to be senseless, undermining its credibility as a defender of human rights. In his epilogue, Mark pronounces the hope that the innate decency of the American people will put an end to the indignities of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. I hope he's right. Nevertheless, the American dream is still so potent. In spite of huge economic inequality, millions of people all over the world still cherish the idea of going to the U.S. to make good. My grandfather was one of them, one of those millions. He believed in that dream. He made good, or good enough. We Europeans tend to smirk when we hear about reinventing yourself. But for Americans, it is very real. You can always ride off into the sunset and start over. And even if you can't, it's still liberating to think that you can. It is as Marx says, I quote, America is about new possibilities, not always about objections and possible risks. Here, life is a roller coaster, here being the US in this case, here life is a roller coaster in which everyone is free to bump his own head. <laughs> Marx Chavon. Be welcome to this all-American evening. It's a, an absolute pleasure to see all of you in this uh, Anton Phillips Let Make Things Better Hall. <laughs> It's an honor to later join the panel with Anne Swartz and James Kennedy and Tom DeLuca, who know more about much. 
do enjoy their presence. And that of our moderator, Tracy, I can testify every word you spoke I agree with, if I may. She's going to trace some of her roots and interests, having received a most prestigious award, Fellowship at Harvard School of Design. Congratulations. In the first days of my first stay in the United States, I made a decision. I bought my first transistor radio. It was a Norelco, then the American face of Philips. That part of the decision was my irrational token of solidarity with the Netherlands. But there and then when I switched it on, that radio opened my ears to the fullness of New York City and America. In those post-flower power days and post-Kent State shooting days, even the modest campus riots at Columbia University gave me a sense of being where the action was. Those were the days of Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. Watergate was brewing. Richard Nixon was president and our professors at the Columbia Journalism School taught us how to grill Herb Klein, Nixon's communications director. One of my classmates rarely showed up at these events. And only just recently, in 2004 actually, I found out why. As it turned out, during that year he was writing an inside history of the Vietnam protest movement with his future brother-in-law and still best friend, John Kerry. In 2004, my friend played an important role behind the scenes in raising funds for the Democratic candidate. And when Kerry's presidential candidacy hit the rocks in 2004, it became clear my friend David and I had not been fully trained for the havoc the conservative revolution would wreak on serious journalism. Kerry was shot down on the electoral battlefield by the outright lies of a group called Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. Many in the press printed their stories about Kerry's so-called non-heroism without further research. Objectivity was gone as the guiding principle in the profession. Truth became truthiness. Fair and balanced reporting had become the farcical slogan of Fox News, which reports nothing but its own truth and treats balance as a liberal con trick on the silent majority. As the comedian Stephen Colbert said the other day at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, reality has a well-known liberal bias. <laughs> the President of the United States, just a few feet away, didn't seem to enjoy that part of the speech. More shocking, many in the mainstream press didn't even report Colbert's contribution to the evening. In my book, I try to describe this degradation of the American media climate. It's one of four near revolutionary changes I witnessed in the American landscape. The, other, the others are, number two, the US assuming after 9-11 the role of world policemen the self-appointed Democracy in Action Brigade, too hurried to consult with so-called allies, let alone world bodies. Major change number three in my book is what I dub the Neoconomy Revolution. The title is borrowed from Daniel Altman's excellent book that explains the original design of four successive tax cuts that aimed at fundamentally changing society. And number four is the increase in political and societal influence of the evangelical movement that participated in the election and re-election of President George W. Bush. This movement keeps pressing for adoption of its views in the realms of law, media, medicine, procreation, science, and many other fields. The coming together of these potentially revolutionary developments is the key to understanding how the U.S. could change so dramatically over the past five years. Without his evangelical inspiration, George W. Bush might never have taken over the 
rather far-fetched idea of the neoconservatives to remodel the entire Mideast after the American model. Neither would 9-11. And without the nationalistic solidarity around flag and war president, the conservatives might never have been able to lower taxes this drastically four times. With the uncritical dedication that comes with a war sentiment, the call for more religiousness could succeed in many more of public life. Without the national sense of loss 9-11 caused, and the emphasis on making the US safer around the globe, the media could not have been politicized so quickly. Almost everybody, especially in the serious press, fell into a kind of patriotic coma. It also worked the other way around. Without the reversal of many values in the media, a relatively small number of people had seen the light, could not have taken along America and the world on a very radical course. They managed to make what happened seem logical and almost unavoidable. Under these circumstances, the US tended to divide mankind, mankind in good and evil. Along this axis, the four radical changes developed. After 9-11, for sure it was, whoever is not for us is against us. That foreign policy approach was very well accepted in a country where Christian values in the public debate had definitely gained ground since President Reagan. The urge to put pay to the 60s, portrayed as weakling and unprincipled, had stimulated a movement pro-marriage meaning a ritual between man and woman, and thus against living together, against same-sex marriage, and also against welfare, against anti-conception, against all kinds of social entitlements, and against international treaties and cooperative arrangements. At the end of 2005, the dust began to settle. In May 2006, President Bush's approval ratings are at historic lows. The war in Iraq has left over 2,600 Americans dead and many thousands maimed and injured, physically and mentally. All those virtues and values on which George Bush was re-elected last year seem forgotten. In the run-up to the congressional elections in November 2006, doubts about Iraq and the war against terrorism are bound to play a major role. America has changed, you might have noticed. For the time being, sole superpower has made itself pretty well seen and heard over the past few years. At first it seemed a nervous wreck when attacked. Then it became militaristic and oblivious to the rule of law. At first I thought, this is not my America anymore. The country where in the, those earlier days I had discovered a true deep sense, sense of freedom through that first Norelco radio of mine. It felt as if I didn't recognize my love. The sense of endlessness shrunk because of all these implicit limits on free thinking and free acting that you have to live lived through to believe. Fun seemed indecent. Whoever is not pro-military solution is a weakling. Whoever doesn't pray with us is against us. One truth fits all. However, during the five and a half years I lived in the country at the beginning of this century, I found that the open America is still there, just like in the past. Ordinary people who had lived, who had built a living and built a life, without that fantastic network, but with hard work, people who don't expect more than a fair deal. I encountered those people and they gave an enormous amount of hospitality, helpfulness, friendship. Many of those people don't take themselves as seriously as we fear from here. In public though, that America was hard to find. Many citizens seem to agree voluntarily with a kind of mental martial law, too often love of flag and uniform and contempt for the unknown were synonymous with love of the country. 
the entire world was made witness and hostage of America's state of confusion. Nothing and nobody was left untouched by the world leader who claimed the sole right to declare good and evil. But I can assure you, to most Americans, these were baffling years. Even in the most remo remote parts of the country, I found people who knew very well what was going on outside the US, who saw how their government played with fire. Others who agreed with the military action as an answer to terrorist attacks, often warmly took care of their own circle and proved more uncertain than haughty in worldly affairs, even if their own life became more dominated by security concerns and militarism, they kept believing in America's future and above all, in America's goodness. My book is the result of my search for the US at the time of George W. Bush. It's not about George W. Bush. The way it has developed thanks to and in spite of the conservative revolution my book poses many questions and I hope it offers a few answers. I would like to end this brief presentation by reading a few paragraphs from the book as is usual at this kind of John Adams Institute evening. But as it happens to be written in Dutch, I did my best at translating it into proper American. Be kind. <laughs> Idle wild, homesick, for apartheid. The road is long and not very fascinating. Trees, lots of trees and lakes. A nice try imitating Finland. Then a flashing light, a sleepy railway crossing and the first cottages. Most are gray and shabby. Hotel Casablanca, it has no glass left in its windows. Most shocking is the realization that former glory days only seem to have existed in the mind. <coughs> idle wild, an idle paradise. This is supposedly the place to be for older Americans. They fondly remember it. The place where music stars like Stevie Wonder, Bill Cosby, Della Rees, Louis Armstrong, Sammy, J Sammy Davis Jr., B.B. King, comedian Dick Gregory, novelist, Charles Chestnut, heart surgeon Daniel Hale Williams, boxing hero Joe Lewis, and the activist intellectual W.E.B. Dubois spent their summers supporting each other on their way to national and international fame. Idlewild in Northwest Michigan has been lovingly dubbed the Black Eden. It was the resort of choice for the black upper class as long as they weren't welcome yet in Cape Cod Miami Beach and Las Vegas. Everybody who was somebody in African America summered in Idlewild, listening to the, the best music, musicians of the day, partying and relaxing. Quote, in Idlewild, we were on vacation from racism, says Ronald Stevens, head of African American studies at Metro State College at Colorado University. With Idlewild as his prime case in point, he's writing the history of the time when racial discrimination was still just about legal. The bonding was intense, he tells. When it was over, the shock came as a surprise. It almost sounds like nostalgia in the former Eastern Germany when Stevens observes, quote, some people say blacks were better off under segregation a larger percentage of blacks were homeowners. Houses outside the ghetto were unaffordable. During segregation, blacks had a credit line at Mrs. Jones's corner store. That was mostly gone afterwards, when segregation legally ended. In many cities, proud black neighborhoods went down the drain when the well-to-do African Americans of those neighborhoods embraced the freedom and moved on." End of quote. The 1964 Civil Rights Act meant the end of Idlewild as an imagined black Saint-Tropez. Wealthier African Americans stayed away ever since. 
they now could afford to visit the resorts they had been dreaming of in the entire United States. Black show business personalities could make up for their lost years on stages all over America and abroad. Idlewild was stuck when I visited with 14 outdated motels, nine nightclubs and six restaurants. They didn't have to be closed. They had fallen apart already in a couple of years. The only night spot still there is the Flamingo Club, desolate and deserted. What happened to the Black Eden happened nationwide, recalls Benjamin Logan. He's the first black chief justice in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His father used to run a flourishing chain of bars and night spots in Detroit, Daytona and fashionable Idlewild. Young Ben was assigned to deal with non-paying customers and self-paying barkeepers. The Logans ran the Flamingo Club. Quote, the abolition of racial discrimination ended most of African American businesses, remembers Judge Logan, with undeniable nostalgia. The Civil Rights Act had a deadlier effect on black America than SARS did on the world. Unquote. Thank you. Mark, I wanted to begin by asking you a personal question. Um, I think you would probably have preferred to have stayed to see what happens to this if there is going to be regime change in the U.S. as well. Tiny microphones. Yeah. Um, Big guy. <laughs> I didn't leave the country. I'm only physically here, but I'm, I stay in touch. Actually, it's true. I never left France and I never le left Great Britain, Tracy. Oh. I keep those part of my, <laughs> as part of my system. Well, of course, what I was really saying, Mark, <laughs> and you know that, we've known each other for a long time, um, what do you think is going to happen in the next two years? Ah, uh, that's not journalism. <laughs> no, that's crystal ballism. <laughs> I, I didn't take a course on that. Um, well, live dangerously. But that's I do the American predict, way. I do predict there will be a, a new president elected in November 2008. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, <happy, can> y'all? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come back to this later, you bet. <laughs> um... You've made it abundantly clear in your work for the paper that Bush is in many ways more representative of America and the American people than we perhaps would like to think. Nevertheless, for me as a reader, it was fairly clear that you were not a great fan. Could you come clean on that now for once and for all? I must admit I've heard this once before, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to add that I got emails during my reporting years of people who said, you're such, such a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes cliffhangers. You're such a propagandist. You're always explaining this ridiculous, dangerous dictator. You're always covering his ass with your quasi-serious explanations of his policies. Why don't you stop? So every week at the end, I... I piled the pro and the con emails and um, as long as there were a few in both piles I was happy. In other words, um, I did my best at explaining what happened, what people did, what they said and possibly why they said. And um, every now and then 
I was taken aback when Bush seemed to ride roughshod on the rule of law. But then I called a lawyer explaining to me the, the pros and cons of his position and I tried to report those. We foreign correspondents are not in the business of voting and we are not in the business of liking people. We are in the business of describing their motives and But is it still possible to be objective in a country that is so polarized as the U.S. now is? It's hard. Isn't it everything you choose, every... I'm sorry, we're getting into a journalism discussion, which maybe is not the point of the evening, but it's, of course it fascinates me. But isn't every choice of subject that you make, everything you're going to write about, every argument that you produce in a polarized climate like this going to be interpreted one way or the other, no matter what you do? It's true that, that, especially in America, everything seems to be polarized. There were not that many people who didn't have an opinion on George W. Bush. And um, as I tried to describe in the media chapter, that, that the, the bricks are coming from, in from every side, from e every direction and angle. Um, that's why the American press is, is um, in turmoil. But nevertheless, I had to try and do my best according to the rules I learned at Columbia. <laughs> oh. oh, that sheds a whole different light on things. <laughs> and Swartzen, you're in the media yourself at Bloomberg, and you've um, studied the changes of the American media in recent years. Yes, thank you, Tracy. Uh, I'd like to um, actually, but first, I'd like to begin with a couple of remarks uh, following up on what you said about being a kind of double nationality. I'm not a double nationality. I'm the real thing. I'm a real American. Uh, <laughs> What's <but> that? <laughs> I wonder sometimes. Uh, in fact, uh, I haven't. I, I'm, I'm also a fake in the sense that uh, I haven't lived in the United States since 1992, when my husband and I moved to Canada to be foreign correspondents for the Washington Post, uh, and hence to France. And we often joke to each other in France that we should have a different word for Americans who are from the States. You know, those people who come over and they wear sneakers and they don't speak French and they're overweight and, you know, we, we, don't, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't quite feel like we're there. And in fact, um, I was in Colorado not long ago and went into a bank to get some money and the teller asked me if I was having a nice day. And I, I just wanted to say, what do you care? So, so just, just, just to give you an idea of, of, of where I'm coming from here. Um, and, and of course, if you're in America, it is all about America. I was, I was back in my hometown in Ohio just recently and uh, turned on one of the morning news programs. And of course, they're all the same and they all have America in the name, right? So there's American morning and there's Morning in America, and there's American news, and they're all, and indeed, it's it's like a baby being born every morning because everything's fresh. There's no news from Asia, even though the Asian day is complete. There no, there's no news from Europe, even though Europe is halfway through its day. It's just everything. Here's what's going on in America, and here's what's going to happen in America. So, so Mark, certainly for your book, you chose a good subject, right? Because that's what everybody cares about is America. <laughs> um, but, but um, to, to address some of Mark's points about the, the media, I actually uh, don't entirely agree. Um, not that I think the media is any better than he says, uh, but I think, in fact, objectivity for many years has been slipping in American journalism. Uh, you know, we can go back to uh, yellow journalism and uh, the days of Hearst and Pulitzer and, uh, you know, on through, you know, the new journalism. Uh, I think objectivity has always been a little... Uh, questionable and there's always been a lot of uh, scandals. A few years before I joined the Washington Post in 1981, uh, the Post had to give back a Pulitzer Prize because a reporter named Janet Cook had fabricated an eight-year-old drug addict named Jimmy. Uh, and this was dis discovered, well, I won't go into it's a long story, but it was a very bad episode. A pro TV program called Dateline NBC, it turns out, was doing a story about a particular model of car that allegedly spontaneously burst into flames, but they couldn't make it do that on camera, so they set it on fire. So, I, so, so, so media has always been a little questionable, but um, uh, I, I do agree with, with Mark that in this current administration, for whatever, re for whatever reason, that the media has become kind of numb, you know, or at least it was in the, in the run-up to the, to the war in Iraq. And I think that has to do with a number of, of factors. One is the, uh, 
genius, if you will, of Karl Rove and the Bush administration in creating this, as, as Mark put it, this mentality of you're either with me or you're for terrorism. I mean, really, as you remember, in the run-up to the war, it was that simple, and, and faced with that, the media simply caved. You know, to, to see CNN's coverage of the invasion, I don't know if you all watched some of that on CNN International with Walter Rogers' voices about riding through the desert, and you'd never guess that they were actually out to kill people and, and conquer a country. Um, Recreating the wagon train. Recreating the wagon train. Uh, the other thing that's, that's going on, and I won't dwell on this uh, too long, is that the, the financially, uh, the media are in crisis. Uh, newspapers are losing circulation. They don't know what to do about the internet. Uh, their readership is less educated, certainly less interested in the media. Uh, so they're seeking any kind of uh, cheap solution or cheap trick to, uh, to get readers. Um, and, you know, if that involves, you know, going along with whatever the current wave of thought is, I think that has happened. I'll, I'll end on a bright spot, of course, which is that um, it, just in this last year, we've seen some really fine reporting uh, on some of the abuses uh, put forward by the Bush administration, uh, the secret prison camps in Eastern Europe, uh, the domestic surveillance uh, by, the, uh, by the NSA. Uh, it's rather scary that Republicans in Congress are talking about putting those reporters in jail, but I think we can be glad at least that there are still reporters in America who are willing to report those stories. Cheap tricks in the media, James Kennedy? Um, well, you know, I just uh, sort of to take, it, take what uh, you've said in just a different tack, and is that, yeah, I mean, Amer American, uh, American uh, media has never made, has never made uh, objectivity its major um, emphasis. That's something that uh, has not been a strong point of the American media. And it goes back, uh, I mean, a couple things. I mean, first of all, you talk about yellow journalism, but even the, the positive sides of American journalism, the good things about American journalism haven't always been founded in in sort of this balanced objectivity. If you think about, there's an American tradition of, of muckraking, of going after sort of investigative reporting, where you go in and find out all the dirt about a bad company or about a bad person. That's not, uh, that's not really the, that's not a Dutch style standard of objectivity. And that's also part of the American tradition. So I was wondering, you know, to, to some extent, um, uh, it's also the, some of the good sides of American journalism come from the come from the fact that it is not uh, always aimed at objectivity, but of course there are bad things. And one thing that strikes me about this current uh, about the last five years with the war on terrorism is that the American media has reacted um, to uh, that war in the way that they react to most wars. If you look at the First World War. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, you know that uh, the media was in a patriotic coma after 2001. Well, it was certainly in a patriotic coma after in, in 1917 and 1918, and also with uh, successive wars, for us, um, the the Second World War, uh, the Vietnam War, for a number of years. You came in on the back end of that war where the media had sort of you know, rediscovered itself in its critical role, but that was not how it was in 65 or 66. But the plus side about that, and that also ends where, you know, where you, uh, where you end, is, is that after a number of years, uh, the media uh, does rediscover um, a more effective and a more positive role, and that's, I think, also beginning to happen now in the United States. But what you're saying, then, is that... Um campaigning is both in the nature of the political machine and in the nature of the media that are supposed to tell us about the machinations going on. That's that's right. It's always, I mean, to use the, you cite the American... I find that unsettling. Yeah. Well, it is unsettling, but it's about marketing. It's about, uh, and it's about also selling your, uh, it's about selling your paper, selling your product, and it's about advancing your cause. And, and this is something that has been part of American media for a long time. Um, Walter Lippmann, the intellectual in 1922, says that you can't trust the media to be objective because they pander to people. They pander to people's emotions and they pander to the self-interest of people and uh, therefore you will never, you can never count on the media, the American media, but he meant, he meant primarily the American media 
people um, to uh, to be objective about uh, about public issues. So so I think this is something that goes way back. It's deeply embedded, and um, yeah, I mean, for all the plus sides that can come out of it, because you know, if you if you've got this cause you want to advance, then you can actually sometimes the public uh, the public good is served by it. That yeah, by and large, uh, there's nobody looking, t even trying in many cases to uh, to have a kind of objective, balanced uh, look on the um, on on the pub on public life. I think Mark is going to want to have a word with you when we're done here this evening. <laughs> I, if I may, I I would like to add one word. Uh, I think this again is is very American. That that same Columbia Journalism School that taught me this pious. Uh, creed of uh, objectivity is is Pulitzer's school. Pulitzer who knew something about yellow press. I yes. mean uh, the, the, the country that puts on this, this militaristic face is the same country that puts on this face of bringing democracy to those in want of it. So American journalism has a, has a two-faced tradition. Tom DeLuca, and bringing democracy to those who aspire to it without mm. their knowing. <laughs> well, again, um, um, I, I think that uh, we could go back in American history and we find a lot of these occurrences. I mean, you go back to the War of 1812, the effort to inflame passions, uh, World War I. What was, sorry, what was the War of 1812? Uh, War of 1812? Oh, uh, well, the war when we decided we were going to take over Canada. Um, you live in Canada, but, or, or it depends on your point of view. I mean, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but I, I don't really want to talk about that war. I've, there's another, there are there's plenty another, of others. There's another war I, I have in my mind at the moment. Um, so very often in American history, we have these examples of really um, not only the press, but the, the society going into a kind of uh, amnesia or forgetfulness about what came before and what they're doing at the present time. Um, I personally think that that's characteristic not only of America, but of war. I think when societies go to war, I mean, you have even much worse examples of that right here in Europe. Certainly uh, Nazi Germany being the obvious and easy example, but we could think of others as well. So I think when you get in, when you get in a situation where you're going to fight a war and people's lives are at risk and more than their lives, their whole sense of, uh, of themselves and being, you always run the risk that you will really forget whatever uh, core values you have that are worthwhile. And that has certainly happened in American history. 1916, uh, 1916, President Wilson ran on a platform of he kept us out of war, only to find 1917 come and he, he got us into the war, right? So uh, distortions, I mean, the press don't have a monopoly on them. It wasn't the press's fault, but the press was complicit in building the war fever that Wilson himself exploited. I think similar things could be said about every American war. I won't, um, I won't mention, uh, I, I can't really speak to Europe, except though to say, Mark, that, it, that uh, um, America has Pulitzer, uh, but uh, Europe has uh, Nobel, right, with both the Peace Prize and Dynamite. So I'm not sure, I think all, all societies have, uh, have their contradictions. Um, let me just though, what I'd like to do very briefly to the question of democracy. I think one of the most important things for us today to understand about the United States is something that I, I grapple with and I have a few of my students here I torture, torture them with, which is to try to understand why is it that a country as powerful and in, in many respects as secure as the United States will often behave as if it's on the edge of demise or is so insecure. Why is it that America with all of its power, with its oceans as boundaries, often acts as if it's really at risk. And it seems to me that this question is very important, and that's why I think that the four points that Mark raises, the points about America's, the, the crisis that he's talking about now, America's place in the world, the turn to neoconservative economics, the turn toward renormalization or re-Christianization of America and, and the further demise of the media. All of these points, I think, need to be thought about in the context of, and maybe we can think about this, why is it that at this point in American history, our need for our identity as Americans seems to be outstripping other very valuable needs and interests that we have? For example, our material well-being, our social welfare, 
our values, our American pragmatism? Why is our need for identity so deep in us at this point that I think it leads us to undermining the kinds of things that Mark talks about when he identifies these four points of crisis? So I just wanted to raise that as a question. I, Are you unfortunately, going to I don't it? have the. <laughs> I, well, I do have an answer, but <laughs> maybe. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't. I have a. I have some tentative ideas, is, is what I would say. I, I don't have a full answer, but but simply to say that a couple of things. One is that polarization uh, and what has become demonization in American politics, uh, in the most recent swing of it, is about 40 years old. It's been going on for quite a long time. Right about the time that Mark came to America uh, is when it really was starting with the uh, sort of a toward the end of the Vietnam War. Um, liberals versus conservatives, conservatives versus liberals. One idea I'll just throw at you is not an idea of my own, but of a, a political a scientist from Brown University named James Maroney, who says that America is a Puritan nation. But normally when we think of Puritanism, we think of Calvinism. We think of the kind of Puritanism that blames the individual for being evil. But, but uh, Maroney actually suggests there, there are two wings of, plur, uh, of uh, Puritanism. One is what we understand is the kind of old Victorian Puritanism, which we'd, we would likely identify with people like President Bush uh, or conservatives. But there's another kind of Puritanism, which called social gospel, which, which equally, with equal fire and brimstone and hellfire, blames the community for the problems. And I think you see this place uh, play itself out in American history uh, and American politics, where on the one side liberals and on the other side conservatives uh, are so convinced that they're right that we really do have this kind of puritanical war. And liberals may look more, um, more liberal, <laughs> but they're equally fervent. By the way, I say that as a liberal, <laughs> a very strong liberal. Sometimes some would view beyond the pale, right? Mark, do you recognize this? Absolutely. It my follow-up question would be why if, if uh, say, the American left or the Democrats, I mean, the American left is to the, to the right of conservatives in Europe, that's always a confusing uh, detail, but wh why is the American left without a voice, if they're so puritanical, if they're so convinced of their own right, why can't they come up with a platform these days? I thought this. I thought this was a great one for you, but uh, so. Uh, well, I mean, I do think that it's it is important to understand that uh, that there is this uh, that there is this moral uh, um, conflict that's going on a long time. It's as you say in its last permutation, it's going been going on for forty years. But this is something that you see back uh, back and forth um, in. Um, the uh, in American society back into the 19th century. I think one reason why there's a certain imbalance now, why the why the right seems to be more um, winning more, is is because that there is this um, um, general loss of uh, conviction that collectivities can do very much of anything. That's something you see also not just happening in the United States, but also in Western Europe. That um, that communities are not uh, the communities are not the place to look, but it's uh, but it's increasingly the individual that needs to be uh, placed uh, uh, under scrutiny. And that's something you see, obviously, the neoliberal uh, trends happening in the Netherlands as well. And it's not, the Netherlands is not the only country in Western Europe where this is where this is occurring. So one of the interesting things is that the United States is not just I mean, the fact that, that the right and its emphasis on the individual uh, is winning out only in the United States, but this is, a, this is a much wider trend in Western societies. But how can this be true if you see the tremendous trend towards, towards large religious communities as a very strong political power? Take the example of the megachurches, mm -hmm. churches with five, six, seven, 23,000 members, and they all come together on Sunday. Where do they park? <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's uh, the, the, the the parking park lots on the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and then they have a barbecue. <laughs> Sorry, the question it, was no. Yeah, I mean, well, because 
I think one of the things is that, and that's something also that's important to keep in mind, is, is that uh, you know, if you, you have an idea of a sort of a megachurch, you belong to these collectivities, and these are sort of monolithic collectivities that completely absorb their members into some kind of collective, uh, collective fantasy and of collective fa- fanaticism. But one of the things about megachurches that is um, what makes them so popular is that belonging uh, to them uh, is something that uh, you can suit to taste. So that if you want to go in and be completely anonymous, uh, well, having a church with 30,000 members is a perfect place to be completely anonymous. And that's why a lot of people go to mega churches so they can go right in and they can go right back out. But there are also core members who become much more engaged. Um, but I think it also ties into an American theme that uh, Americans don't see voluntary collectivities as being antagonistic to the individual at all. Um, that I'm an individual, I'm a free individual, and so I'll choose my religion, and I'm going to go to this mega church this year, and if I don't like that one, or uh, the minister wore the wrong kind of tie, then I'm going to go over to, to another one. And um, so, so I think that that's, so in that, in that sense, um, I, I don't see this as being, uh, I, don't, I don't see the interest in mega churches and the interest in religion uh, as such as being somehow a break with that. It's also, I think, very much the question whether uh, the United States is numerically speaking, Christianizing or re-Christianizing at all. Um, the, big, the big membership launch, that's when the churches really became big, uh, was in the 1950s. And it really, ha- you haven't seen those kinds of statistics since then. Uh, the numbers of church attendance, the numbers of church, uh, number of people being members of churches is actually either static or going down in the United States. So it's, uh, so it's not that the United States is becoming more and more religious. Um, I think what you can say is, is that um, because uh, segments of the religious right are getting better organized, that they are more, they're much more visible. visible and they're better positioned to make their power count. I think one of the functions of that is, is education. I mean, that's something that isn't, I mean, you, you, you say lots of things in your book, but one of the reasons why you're having a res- resurgence of the religious right is, is that um, that evangelicals and fundamentalists who used to be on the margins of American society, they're better educated now, they've gone to college, they're making, they've got better incomes, they've got more clout. And so in some sense, uh, this is a uh, their power now also has something to do with their social and economic success that they did not have 50 years ago. Uh, yeah, just a brief point on that, which is I think part of what you're suggesting um, that uh, evangelicals uh, did, were not very political if you go back to the 50s and 60s. But coming out of the culture wars of the 60s and 70s, especially with issues like abortion, they became more political and that was used. Uh, they were appealed to on those grounds. They were mobilized and organized and they became more involved politically. So I think part of what we see is the increased role of Christianity in, Amer- in America is really the increased political mobilization of uh, Christian evangelicals, uh, by and large, to the benefit of the Republican Party. So I, it's partly, it's not so much that religion has gotten that much deeper, so much that it's become more political in the sense of the evangelicals becoming political. There, there's always been politics in religion, and of course, as uh, those of us that are liberals, we, we often celebrate some of this politics. For example, the civil rights movement and the role of black churches was very vital in the civil rights movement. Well, the evangelicals and, and the right wing of the Republican Party replayed that tape, but to a different tune in the 1980s uh, to the present time. I'm going to comment on something else. Okay. Do you agree then, um, Professor Kennedy, with Mark's choosing religion as one of the four sea changes that he discusses in his book? Or is this just um, religion redux? Um, I think that, you know, one of the things, this is, um, I I think one of the interesting connections is what does 9-11 do with religion? um, And does that change it? Um, I think the resurgence of the religious right, and it's not just evangelicals, but it's also conservative Catholics, um, who are numerically an important part of that group. But um, that's really a story of the last 25 years, and it's a very important story of the last 25 years. You see it coming up with uh, the rise of Ronald Reagan. Um, I'm not sure, and that's what I'd like to hear more about you. I mean, really, to what extent 
9-11 changes that quarter century trend? Um, I mean, you see evangelicals generally more and members of the religious right and generally supportive of the war in Iraq. So they sort of made that a cause. So in that sense, the issues that they are willing to fight for have changed. Have it started to include uh, the um, the intervention, the war in Iraq? But what else? Uh, what else does the? How else does it? Um, how else does it change it? And uh, and that's that's one of the questions I'm I'm not sure about. And that was one of the questions I was left with uh, after reading your your book, Mark. I recall that uh, the entire evangelical. Uh, marketing tool Karl Rove employed uh, for the 2000 election was a sort of a, an atypical thing somewhere in the corner. After 9-11, American public life was emotionalized and it stayed emotionalized and emotionalized is very close to religionized. We had this president who was photographed in prayer. Stories leaked about foreign dignitaries visiting the White House, disturbing the president in prayer at the Oval Office. And this was leaked on purpose, I'm pretty sure. The president led the country. By the way, we have to have a war. In, I mean, one of the, certainly there is a move toward religion um, in times of war, you can see that. So presidents leading uh, the country in prayer, even, uh, even presidents who weren't inclined to do that, like James Madison did so in the War of 1812. Uh, so, um, I must have missed something at school. So, but, uh, you weren't born yet. So, uh, <laughs> or I was asleep during history class. But is that a, I, mean, I think one of the questions is, but then what kind of religion are we talking about? Are we talking about, is this evangelical religion or is this a kind of civic religion that Americans use uh, uh, in time of war? One, the reason, one of the reasons why I bring that up is, is because I actually don't find the evangelical faith of George Bush to be very um, evangelical. Um, <laughs> That, that, that is to say, he's broadly evangelical, but he's always been criticized and increasingly been criticized by the religious right for not really being, really being a, a kind of reliable biblical uh, president. So, so you know, so uh, I'm, I try to. So when you see this reintroduction of religion after. 9/11. Then I sort of wonder: is that is that the evangelical uh, thing at work, or no, is that take, sort of the civil religious thing at work? My take on it is 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 a bit different. Um, I dare say that 9/11 um, added so much heat to the public space that everything became fluent that was already brewing. And um, what do you mean by fluid? Yeah. Going everywhere. <laughs> it, somewhere in my chapter, God Lives in Colorado Springs, I visit uh, Pastor Ted, the, the New Life Church uh, CEO. <laughs> Pastor Ted receives me on white socks and uh, tells me, without any secretiveness, about his Monday afternoon call to Karl Rove. He is the, the president of the, what's called the evangelical... National Association of Evangelicals, I think. Yeah. I think that kind of uh, political weekly phone call, um, on, and he counts many more groups, Latin Americans, uh, they, they count Roman Catholics, as long as they are evangelical in the mind mm -hmm. and in the practice, they call them part of their 100 million plus movement. And I think the fact that they stepped up their political campaign and really wanted, in exchange for their reliable vote, voting behavior, really wanted political paybacks was new. And they could do it partly under cover of 9-11 and the, and the climate of a president who was a spiritual leader. I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask uh, Mark and the other panelists com coming off of that point, how it is that the Democrats let the Republicans get a monopoly on God. Well, I... And, uh, 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 because they really, you know, all during that period, I mean, Democrats go to church, right? But somehow they let uh, Bush and Karl Rove steal not just that argument, but for a while, 
just about everything else. I mean, why during the period you were there, what should the Democrats have done? Where, where, where did they fail uh, and lose complete control of the agenda? Is there anything that, that, a, that a, smart majority, a smart minority leader or a smart uh, Democratic leader could have done? Um, I think um, the Democrats left themselves be dubbed wimps. That was one of Karl Rove's major successes, that every and any Democrat who criticized the president was just blatantly anti-American. And they couldn't wrestle themselves away from that tiny corner. I recall the, the 2004 um, Boston Democratic Convention where John Kerry had been uh, praying away the Sundays before, showing off his Roman Catholic uh, lifestyle and what have you. He failed completely. Evangelicals and, and um, the faithful around the Republican machinery made it clear that John Kerry's belief was a, a was confectionery, was, was just bought in the supermarket, <laughs> like his uh, war heroism. And he couldn't resist. And, and, and uh, I interviewed people who have been studying religion and, and, and did surveys, etc. And they all came up with the same conclusion. As long as Democrats can't find a candidate who is truly and from birth has been religious and lived God's life, God's will, they will not have, an, have a, a president re-elected or elected as a Democrat. Can I put my theory to you? Sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I was just, I was just going to say that I don't, I don't actually believe that uh, is true. That is, I think, I think uh, the problem that the Democrats have um, is th the, the problem is they've been losing and they haven't been able to set the agenda. It's not that they don't have an agenda. I think that gets exaggerated. But I think because of the fact that they've been losing, they, they've had a very difficult time setting the agenda. Many Democrats are religious and some aren't. But what, what's happened in American politics for really quite a long time is that no matter who you are, you play at being religious when you run for office. Everybody does it. So the fact that John Kerry did it, and he may full well believe it, it really doesn't, it, there's nothing unusual about that. Um, the role of religion in American politics goes way back when w William McKinley in 1898 or 9, when before we decided to make the Philippines a colony, he got down on his knees and he prayed to his God to see whether or not in fact the U.S. should deviate from its historic mission of never having colonies. I guess God told him we needed a colony because the <laughs> Philippines uh, became a colony until 1946 and we had our first Vietnam War. 1906, 1907 in the Philippines. So this, this goes way back. And, you know, uh, Bill Clinton was in and out of church. Hillary Clinton, you can bet, is going to be in and out of church religiously, at least from a political point of view, uh, for the next uh, couple of years. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's the issue so much. I think the problem is that too often when the Democrats... Um, try to out-Republican the Republicans. They look like posers. John Kerry put on his hunting jacket and he shot some geese to prove he was a hunter. I could have told him, if you're going to go hunting, shoot a bear. Don't shoot <laughs> geese. Right? Hey, at least he didn't shoot his friend. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> John, John Kerry wanted to prove he was an athlete. He went snowboarding. <laughs> you see? There's, uh, there's something the Democrats, they do need a better advisor. But I, I, I think that, um, so I think that there is there's something else at work here. There's, the, the Democrats, unfortunately, uh, have lost a kind of authenticity battle. And I think actually some of them would do better to be more straightforward about where their cores really are. Even on questions, I mean, I would, I would never get paid as a political advisor, you can tell, giving this <laughs> advice. But I would advise someone to be more true to yourself and just lay it, lay it on the line rather than trying to adopt a pose because of the polls. Mm. And I think that's a problem the Democrats had. Um, and, you can, and that can be used against you. John Kerry voted for the Iraq War Resolution because he had been maneuvered by President Bush, by the axis of good and evil issue, into being afraid to be called a wimp. Therefore, he voted for something I believe he didn't believe in. 
And I, I don't think he believed in it. His later excuse was, well, I didn't really vote to go to war. I just voted to authorize the president to have the authority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you don't have to be a political scientist. Perhaps, actually, you shouldn't be a political scientist to understand that John Kerry knew full well what that resolution could lead to. But he didn't have the courage, and I voted for him, at that time, and I understand why, he didn't have the courage to go with his convictions. I believe, had he had the courage, he would have turned a close election into an even much closer election and would have had a better chance to win. I'm not going to get any appointments as an advisor with this kind of advice, but I do think that if you're going to act, you have to be very good at it. And the Democrats really have not been good at these poses, and they should get rid of them. In a few minutes, I'd like to go to you. I'm sure you're bursting with questions, comments, criticism, and remarks. First, I have two questions to put to our panel for this evening. Uh, and to begin with Mark. Mark, do you think um, Bush can finish his second term? Unless someone bombs him out of the White House, he is, has been elected till his term is over. We don't I have, have heard the word impeachment mentioned. Yes, but I, I keep following the word impeachment uh, in uh, alternative websites, but not in real life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any hope here or elsewhere at the table? Fear? There would have to be some shocking revelations that we haven't heard yet. And there would probably have to be a, ch well, I mean, ch legally shocking, constitutionally shocking, and probably a change in the control of Congress as well, although that's not 100% necessary, but not, in the, not, not what we know now, no. We were talking just now about religion, and I think my personal theory is that religion has become much more of a, a, a political club since 9-11. The, the, we're the, 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 the Christians and the Jews, we're the non-Muslims, the enemy is the Muslims. So religion has become a more militaristic uniting factor, I think. Uh, I had to think of this when I was reading Mark's book and also when I read a recent interview in the Volkskrant with Kurt Vonnegut, who said some very confronting things. Very, he's very angry for a man of, what is he now, 83. He said, America is now a fascist country. I don't need protection from Muslims. Please protect me from Americans. Is this, is this a, a, has religion become a uniting factor in this horrendously negative way? Professor Kennedy, what do you think? I find this a terrifying thought. Well, you know, I think that, um, I mean, one of the things that has uh, been interesting about the United States, uh, at least the 20th century United States, is, is that religion has not, well, at least, well, much of the 20th century, the religion has not been a particularly uh, divisive issue. Of course, there have been major, there have been major divides between Protestant Catholics and the question of Jewish inclusion has also has been an important issue with uh, up until the Second World War. Uh, but religion has been a kind of, uh, religion has been a kind of, uh, is something that uh, there's a kind of a broad American um, sympathy toward religious uh, diversity that you don't see in many Western, Euro Western European countries, historically speaking. That, has, that is under pressure. That's under pressure for uh, a number of reasons. That it's under pressure in part because of um, uh, the role of Islam. That's not as, but I would say even there, the, uh, the demonization of Islam is not as prevalent a theme as it is in uh, parts of Western Europe, but it's, but it's there. And the other, the other thing, of course, is that that religious divide, it, the difference between church going and non church going in the United States, between Democrat and Republican, has never been greater than it is right now. So, in that sense, religion has been politicized in a way that has not been politicized before. 30 years ago, the church going rates between Democrats and Republicans was not very great. It was there. Republicans are always more churchy than Democrats, but now that divide is really very substantial. And in that sense, religion has become, uh, America has become a house divided on religion uh, in a way that it has not been for a long time. The case in point is the number of cases the Supreme Court is having to deal with and will be dealing with, um, whether the Pledge of Allegiance can be forced upon my child, etc. Uh, the Ten Commandments on the, on the grounds of the Texas uh, Congress, 
Um, people keep bringing cases like that because the non-believers feel they are a, not threatened, but a minority being made to feel that they are a, an unusual group. So they don't even need Islam and 9-11 as a common enemy? No, and I think you must, you must uh, clearly recognize that President Bush, right after 9-11, um, embraced American uh, Muslims and kept kept going and kept meeting people and and from that front uh, nobody has any complaints. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Well, the floor is yours. Who would like to step up to the microphone and get something off his or her chest? Please. I have one question. Uh, isn't it a bit too early to judge, say, the presidency of Bush at this stage? For comparison, you look at uh, Churchill, who fought the Germans, and in a very critical situation, when London was bombed, there was a lot of resistance as well to the position that he took. Looking back at those years, I think we all agree that he did the right thing, although many people doubted that at the time. So I just wonder how the panel looks at judging Bush at this stage, or should we wait some time to have a real and true verdict? Tom. Uh. I'll hold the microphone for that one. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think you're right in a way, but I, I mean, I have no hesitation whatsoever in judging President Bush with regard to his immoral, illicit, and perhaps unconstitutional, although not un impeachable, unfortunately, a war in Iraq. I think it was just a, a, a great, uh, as an American, uh, after 9-11, as a New Yorker, who uh, lives a mile and a half from where the World Trade Center used to be. I, I take it very deeply and very personally and politically as an American, um, feel that the willful confusion of Al-Qaeda with Iraq and the dissembling about the weapons of mass destruction are inexcusable. And so I have no hesitation on that one point of judging President Bush in that regard, as far as I'm concerned, as an abject failure. And I'll say, well, I'll say one other thing on that point, and that is that after 9-11, uh, the U.S. had a great opportunity to lead, um, um, and I believe that, uh, that we should have led in a different way. I believe we had every right to defend ourselves, and I personally supported the actions in Afghanistan. But I feel that we squandered that opportunity, and what President Bush did hurt the U.S. nation in engaging us in the war in Iraq. Now, it may turn out that the war in Iraq will, will turn out fabulously. There will be a, a, a democracy in the Middle East and, all, and everything that he ever wanted to happen. I, I wouldn't completely rule that out, but my judgment is not based on that. It's based on the reasons for going to war, the damage to the democratic process, the squandering of lives and billions of dollars of American m money that could have been spent on many other things, mm -hmm. and the distortion of the constitutional process. So on that, I'm, I guess I'm saying this is strongly, but I feel it this strongly. On that one point, I, I would give President Bush no quarter. I'll just say, speaking as a journalist, um, you know, we judge people by the hour. You know, so, so Bush will give a speech and you know, the opinion columnists and the blogospheres and so on will be out there, sometimes minute by minute, so, and, which I think is fine. You know, I think you know, there are different time horizons for evaluating a presidency. Were we having this panel uh, two years ago, you know, we would all probably have the same opinions, but we might be muting them a little bit more, you know, because the pendulum hadn't quite swung uh, where it is. So, you know, maybe two years from now, you know, we'd reach a different conclusion. But I don't, you can't wait for history to be all neat and done and sewed up, you know, before you start coming to conclusions, in my opinion. I'm interested to hear your opinion on this. Uh, foreign. <laughs> Oh, you should have seen that dirty look I just got. <laughs> I would have loved to, to be missed out on this one, that's I know, true. I know, I know. Then why did you do it? <laughs> well, because you're the star this evening. Uh, foreign correspondents are not mainly in the opinion business, and in NRC Hannesblad, they don't even publish one piece on the editorial 
an op-ed page during their stay abroad, and that's for good reasons. Um, there's one thing uh, for which I do not have a lot of tolerance, that's for people, um, politicians who don't speak truth to their people, and I don't have too much tolerance for people who um, are oblivious of the rule of law. So whenever I sense that kind of thing happens, I don't admire it. But that's not the main part of my reporting. No. Okay. I uh, do appreciate that you, uh, you respect the rule of law, and we all do, I suppose. I'm a lawyer myself, so I know what a rule of law is about. But isn't it a lot easier for people in the Netherlands who live safely here, who don't commit themselves, who have lost, I believe, one dead soldier in Bosnia, and we have a, a, parliament, a parliamentary inquiry about that, and the United States is, is, is uh, getting the chestnuts out of the fire, I don't know the American expression, but they are, they are being confronted with very difficult questions of life and death, international politics. Isn't it a little hypocritical to say, well, we all want to respect the rule of law when you're in the shoes of someone like Bush who has a lot of other interests to defend? See, Tracy, that's why I didn't like your question. <laughs> but somewhere in the book, I do give a better reply than I'm now able to give to you. I say maybe, it's at the end of chapter one, maybe later on we will say at least the United States put in a, a valiant effort at bringing democracy to the Middle East. At least they tried. Implication, what did we do? I hope that serves as an answer. Um, I'm trying to get this lady here to go to the microphone. She doesn't want to. What a thankless task I have this evening. Don't go away. Don't go away. Uh, I'm one of those dual nationals, so uh, American first and Dutch by marriage. <laughs> um, uh, just to follow up on the question that was uh, uh, referred to, I'd like to have the panel's um, views on the present Bush administration uh, attitude toward international law uh, and international in institutions, uh, especially since uh, I would say there's been a tremendous change in relation to the position of the United States um, during the Second World War and thereafter supporting uh, the Court of International Justice long before uh, the Covenant of the League of Nations long before, but then also since the World War, <clears throat> the Charter of the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the Geneva Conventions of 49 and 77, the IAEA also as a watchdog organization. Uh, what has changed and why has it changed since the U.S. has given such leadership in that field, and today seems to have turned its back on international organizations. Are you a lawyer yourself? No, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a social worker. <laughs> That's a good Tom DeLuca. Oh, yes. Well, uh, for one thing, I would say that the U.S. hasn't. Uh, remember, the U.S. didn't join the League of Nations. Um, and uh, so the U.S. has always been ambivalent, I think, to some degree about international entanglements and uh, not so much the idea of law, but the idea of international entanglements. That's always been uh, um, uh, a uh, question for the U.S. Secondly, I do think the Bush administration is more antagonistic toward in, uh, many in international institutions and treaties than were previous administrations, possibly even including the Reagan administration. So I do think there is a change here that's worth noting, but it's not uh, necessarily a permanent change. It could well uh, shift back. But thirdly, I want to just pick up on a point that Mark alluded to, which is I do think, and this came out of the, other, the question about international law before, which is that I do think that it, um, it, would, be, it would be very helpful uh, to Americans who would like the U.S. to, to um, 
be more willing to abide by international, not just abide by international law, but not to feel the responsibility in the U.S. to go it alone on issues like Iraq, uh, and, and equally importantly, not leave the political ground to those who would like the argument to be that we must go it alone. Uh, not to leave that ground so easy to them by other, uh, uh, other uh, nations, such as the Dutch, but many other nations, taking more of a responsibility in some of the tough issues of international law, uh, particularly with regard to serious, uh, uh, when necessary, not just policekeeping, but military action. I mean, the U.S. shouldn't have had to lead the effort in Bosnia, for example. The more the Europeans would take over those kinds of things, the less ground there would be in the U.S. for those who would, who would argue, as President Bush did, if we don't do it, nobody will do it. You see? So I do think we have, our, we have a job to do in the U.S. to bring us back to in international institutions and the rule of law. But I think also out, outside of the U.S., people have to take more responsibility, including those kinds of responsibilities in which people get killed. It's very uncomfortable, uh, but it's very difficult, but it's very necessary. We did just beef up our troops in Uruzgan in Afghanistan. Does that help? I, I imagine it helps. It, it helps a little bit, but um, I mean, for example, let me just take another example: of Rwanda. I mean, where, where you know, where was the U.S. in Rwanda? Well, we had been burned by Somalia, but that was no excuse. But where was Europe? Uh, in the Congo? I mean, there's just so many examples of this, in which um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Um, uh, Darfur. Um, we have so, drunk in Darfur. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. First, I have to apologize for my American English, which is school Dutch. But uh, I want to come back to uh, the discussion between Mark and the uh, lawyer over there, when the lawyer said, well, the Americans have uh, a lot of uh, interests to defend, and they pick up the chestnuts out of the fire. And Mark said, well, that's just what I want to say at the uh, last uh, chapter one of my book, that at least the Americans have tried to establish a democracy in Iraq. And I think that's a big mistake. When Bush started in Iraq, I remember on television was Nelson Mandela, who said it quite adequate, I think, when he posed the question, how can it be that the most mightiest country of the world has been led by a man without foresight and who can't think properly? Well, that was just the right, the right question, I think. And What is your question? My question, well, when you want the question, is I have heard a lot, a lot of aspects, but I think one thing is, uh, is very, uh, very much lacking, and that's uh, the influence of technologi te technological uh, development, which bring people in a position of thinking they are really independent of everything. For 100 years ago, we were all dependent of nature. 60 years ago, we are dependent of each other. And by now, by technology, we think, well, we can make everything better ourselves. And I think that is something that's very much lacking in the an analysis. That's my opinion. It's not a question. But when, when you want a question, how do you think about this? <laughs> I think we'll just accept that statement for what it's worth. Thank you very much. And can I give the floor to anyone else? We have um, just a few more minutes. This is your chance. Could I ask? Yes, yes over please. Here. Maybe without a microphone. I you use a microphone, please? <laughs> This is one more, yeah. Much of what, what we're talking about tonight is, is politics, and, and when Europeans talk about the U.S., it tends to be foreign politics. We tend to forget about loads of national, internal American issues that we have no idea about. Um, but much of what we're talking about tonight is, relates to the period 0104. And I remember early 04 that a lot of people here thought there's a lot of bad stuff going on in, in American politics, but it's Bush and his cronies. And I remember that deception in November of four, when 200, I don't know how many million Americans, re-elected that Bush. It was not just Bush anymore, it was all of the US. And, and I just wanted to hear your reaction to that, because you're all foreigners who happen to have an American passport. 
Um, and, and we all sort of know what your political bias is. But what, what was your observation um, as, as to the re-election of Bush in 04? I'll just make a couple of uh, personal observations before the experts take over. Just to give you an idea of how strongly uh, the expatriates I knew felt, um, as you know, uh, voter registration among expatriates was higher than, uh, than it ever has been. And I knew several people who flew home to vote because they felt so strongly uh, about the election. They wanted to vote in their home districts. Uh, as for the result, have you seen that map that went around the internet? Uh, you know, you can sort of, the one where, you know, you can play the, the red states, but then if you do it by population, then there's more blue, and if you do it by county, it's more red. And, you know, in, in the end, I think, um, you know, Bush won by three million votes, and I think everyone felt like, I, I personally felt like I'm glad it wasn't closer. I was sorry Bush won, but nobody had an appetite for another Florida, for another Supreme Court battle. Mark, on, in your book, on page 264, to be precise, <laughs> you say Europeans are now more afraid of the U.S. than of terrorism. That some Europeans at some times. <laughs> but not all Europeans all the time. <laughs> Is this meant to pacify me or what? I'm... I'm I've been writing this book to try to do away with as many generalizations as I could muster to kill. And, and, and talking about Americans and talking about Europeans isn't going to help mutual understanding. And I've learned a lot from my co-panelists this night. And I, I'm fascinated by this country and I love it. And I, I love it so much I'm, I feel entitled to criticize it every now and then. Well yeah. Do you feel the gap widening between Europe and the U.S.? Um, no, the only thing is that Europe vanished from the American map. <laughs> well said. Uh, one or two more questions. Uh, I see you over there. Come to the mic already if you could, please, and then this lady first. Thanks. You were speaking about media and the, yeah, the biased media in the U.S. And it, I seem to hear to have heard this uh, in what most of you were saying is that it seems to be a sort of a feedback loop. Media self censors in some ways or decides not to say things when there's not enough room for it in the public debate. It's not easy. I mean, it's too easy to just blame you know the Bush administration or Karl Rove for silencing various media. Media does it to itself as well. Um, so I'm wondering what needs to happen now to bring it back to a more balanced uh, picture in the U.S., in your view? And my second question is, what's different in the European context? Is it more balanced here, and how does that come about? Yeah. Um, I think it's a very good question. Um, my guess, again, this is, I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't in the Washington Post newsroom for the last three years, because my guess is that there and uh, at the New York Times and at other big papers, there has probably been some real thinking about Iraq reporting and did we really do everything we could in the run-up to the war. Uh, there was the whole Judy Miller episode, of course, at the New York Times um, that really showed in, in that particular individual case how one reporter with a strong agenda could essentially dominate coverage. Um, Perhaps you should uh, uh, just refresh our memory with two sentences who Judy Miller was. Yeah, she was the reporter for the New York Times who, uh, never mind her questionable role in uh, the whole Valerie Plame case, which eventually led to her resignation, but her reporting in the run-up to the Iraq war was essentially based on pretty flimsy and biased sources, and day after day, these, you know, and, and, and you know, we're, we're I hate to say pro-Bush, but certainly, you know, uh, her sources were telling her there were weapons of mass destruction. She was really pushing that line on the front page day after day. I think that that whole episode really has helped lead to a kind of rethinking among the media um, about their role. And as I say, I think uh, I'm often asked, this is not quite the question you asked, what's the difference between uh, media and bloggers or journalism and bloggers? At least, as, as Mark said, uh, most of us in the media are trained professionals where we've learned a certain set of rules about balance, about fairness, maybe not objectivity. In the end, I think media falls back on those values. Uh, and I feel like even now the pendulum is sort of swinging more that way. 
can I uh, yes, just uh, please about come to the mic so we can, uh, ahead. just a question about uh, whether it is different in Europe? I, I think that one of the things that uh, characterizes Europe, certainly in the Netherlands, in the last uh, 50 years, is that the uh, that the ideological conflict uh, that is present in the United States is just here is much weaker here. So you you don't have those uh, shrill contrasts that have been part of an American debate for a long time. So you. So certainly since the Second World War, there's been an increasing uh, move toward consensus, and consensus uh, is defined by a relatively small number of uh, people who tend to be well-informed, who tend to want to be balanced in their viewpoints, but who have their own more subtle forms of bias. Um, and so, so it's not that, you know, well, objective uh, Dutch media versus unobjective American media. I mean, there are reasons why why the American media has less of a pretense uh, to be objective, because they're engaged in ideological conflict. But here, uh, here the um, um, here it's actually the creation of a of a of a more of a more consensual model uh, of opinion um, that obviously carries with it all kinds of its own priorities and assumptions, and and I certainly see that as a as a foreigner too. A uh, quick, simple question, really. Uh, what is uh, since uh, since ever, since nine eleven happened? What has been puzzling me, puzzling me since is that um, even up to this day. There seems to be some, I think it's an almost absolute belief in the official account of what happened on 9-11. Now, I, I'm, I'm fully aware of the implications this question has. I still want to ask this panel, what are your views on uh, mainstream media's coverage so far on the events of 9-11 itself? Why has there never been any uh, full investigation uh, by me mainstream media reporters into what actually happened on 9-11. That's what I want to ask you. Uh, hasn't there been? Well, this is news I, to me. As far as I know, there hasn't really been. Maybe I'm wrong, but isn't it true that there seems to be this almost like a mythical absolute belief in what happened on 9-11? Or am I flatly wrong? Please tell me. My recollection of, those, of the aftermath of 9-11 was an enormous amount of newsprint being devoted to what happened minute by minute. And then there were huge amounts of websites with uh, the conspiracy th theories. You could see pictures of everything and the contrary having happened. The Pentagon, I've seen it in, 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 <laughs> in all various positions of being demolished or not being demolished or demolished afterwards. Or and I think we're we should look carefully at all the new facts appearing, but at the moment we're at the same sort of stage as the Kennedy murder. He cannot be murdered by that one guy, but can we prove it? As long as we can't, he has been murdered by that one guy. I would like to... Um, can you do it in two minutes? That's a question. Okay, step up to the microphone, please. <laughs> Uh, I'm an American uh, who's lived uh, here in the Netherlands for about 10 years or so, but I get back to the United States once or twice a year, and there's one pillar that nobody's mentioned uh, in your book, and that's the gap between rich and poor. And every year I go back, the gap seems to widen, and uh, it's uh, obviously not a coincidence. Uh, there have been these four tax cuts, etc. It seems to me that's unsustainable, uh, but it seems also to keep going on, and there doesn't seem to be a reaction against it. Uh, what's going on, and how long can it go on? Uh, Mark, you write extensively about economic inequality in the book. Would you like to say something about this? Yeah, every time I asked a obviously poor person what he or she thought about the next tax cut, very often they agreed. And that's part of the American dream. They hope to join the well of one day, and uh, you might think that's not wise, but um, I recall at, at that chocolate world stadium where 
30,000 people were practicing the wave, expecting George W. Bush. And that one lady and her air conditioning repairman husband, they were overjoyed to be able to see George W. Bush and they were make, making uh, $30,000 a year. And I said to her, isn't John Kerry's health care proposal way better for your family than what George W. Bush is offering? And she said, oh no, his health care plan is pittance for the poor. I like to work for it and I like to make it one day. No, thank you. There. They, they, did a, um, they did a survey of Americans who felt they achieved the American dream, and they asked people with incomes of $15,000 or less what percentage of those people felt they'd achieved the American dream, and 5% said they had uh, achieved the American dream. And then they asked people with incomes over 100000 and 6% thought that they had <laughs> achieved the American dream. So... Um, it shows you how elusive this idea of a dream uh, is, um, but it is you know it is it is one of the most uh, for people who are concerned with uh, with the structures that cause uh, social and economic injustice America is is ultimately very frustrating uh, country because this has not been part of the for a relatively short time this was part of the American political debate from the 1930s not really earlier and that's already very different from what you see in Europe from the 1930s uh, lasting until about the 1970s and after 1980 uh, it really d is not part of uh, the a national issue at all and that's also the time 1980 when you start seeing the increase again in the discrepancy between rich and poor. Just a, a quick comment on that. Um, people in the top fifth of income voted twice the rate that people in the bottom fifth of income do. Part of the reason for that is that people in the bottom are not mobilized and there's no incentive for politicians to mobilize them and they're not uh, able to mobilize themselves. So in the political, and I, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming them at all. I'm, what I'm saying is there's a built-in built structural inequality in the political system that then gets reflected in the, uh, in, in the economic system as well. Um, now, some people say, but people in the bottom have the same attitudes as people in the top. They all believe in the American dream. I think that's true to a point, but there are also important shades of difference. And I think that were some of these issues to be put on the political agenda, the kind of issues that you're alluding to, and were politicians to, to mobilize people with regard to those issues, we would see new orientations toward the American dream develop. In other words, it would still be the American dream. It might be the American dream isn't being fairly apportioned or something like that. So I think it's possible. So I, again, I think it's, it's another example of when, why in a country like the U.S. or so many of us in a powerful country, why do we, we let our, our needs for our own identity and who we are as Americans, understandable during 9-11 to some degree, but why do we let that go beyond and outstrip and beat down so many other interests we have, for example, in a more egalitarian uh, economic and uh, political system. Or, for example, why don't we ask ourselves questions like, why does the U.S. have the largest per capita prison population in the world if, in fact, we are the land of opportunity? One thing you, you might think about in Europe, uh, American economy is always lionized for our low unemployment rate. We have about six million or so people involved in the prison industry. Let's suppose we cut our prison rate in half Three more million people would have to be employed. What would our unemployment rate be then? Well, that's your it's, answer, isn't it? There, there are a lot of questions about quality of life in America that the demonization in politics, abetted but not caused by 9-11, have helped us not pay attention to. And I'm actually hopeful that as we move in the next couple of years, I think Iraq is going to begin to, I'm hoping, but I think it's possible, is going to be a kind of ironic, ironic twist in which this politics of good and evil ideology, which makes us not see clearly what is in our interest to do, is going to at least fade a bit. And I'm hoping fade enough for us to have the kind of quality of life debate that your question indicates that we need to have. I'm a little hopeful about that. Bravo. Thank you very much, Tom. One of the perks of my job this evening is that I get the last question. It's a question to the panel particularly, but I'm also interested to hear the opinion of the hall. Who will it be in 2008? Condi for Prez or Hillary for Prez? Um, 
I've actually uh, met Mrs. Clinton a few times before she was a senator, seen her on her various uh, foreign trips abroad and so on. And uh, what, what I can tell you is she is a total political professional. And I, I mean, which, you know, I, I, I admire her. I, and I think she's probably the best the Democrats have right now. But I can tell you, she is, you know, this is all she's thinking about right now. And I find it hard to imagine that she won't be the nominee in 2008. But did she go to church from birth? <laughs> she, she did. She did. So. Well, who's it going to be? I'd like to ask a question about the future. This was about the future. Uh, this is a, 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 a 20, 20 years, uh, 25 years. Is it allowed? Uh, no, I'm sorry. We have, to st we have to stop now. This okay. was my perk. All right. Okay. <laughs> but like okay. but um, uh, we'll all still be here. Okay. Who's it going to be? I don't have a guess. I, I think that, um, I mean, Hillary Clinton is obviously the favorite, but she probably won't be, wouldn't be a strong uh, a Democratic candidate, but that could change. Uh, in terms of the Republican Party, I think um, my feeling about Condi Rice is that she seems to get promoted when she fails, so I think we have to see what happens in the war in Iraq and if uh, Iran, if uh, these continue to go very badly, I think she has a very good chance to be president. <laughs> Well, on this utterly pessimistic note, <laughs> I'd like to conclude the evening. Thank you all for being here, for participating, and I'd like to give the last word to Corinne, and I personally want to congratulate Mark on the fruit of his labor. Well, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for your lecture, and thank you very much, uh, Anne Swartzen, Professor Thomas De Luca, and Professor Kennedy for participating in the discussion, and also Tracy Metz, very much thanks, a lot of thanks for moderating this evening and the excellent discussion. It was really good. Uh, and I have some more thanks to go. I would like to thank the musicians, uh, the trio is Jose Vera, Walter Wolf, and Luciano Poli. I also would like to thank Prometheus and NSA Handelsblad for making this evening a success. And I would like to thank Saskia Krikar, director of the Dr. Anton Philipsa and Lucen Theater, who has been very generous to offer us this venue. Uh, and for now, I would also like to let you know that we have some very exciting evenings coming up with, among others, Mark Kurlansky, A.M. Holmes, John Irving, and Madeleine Albright. And that will be also about religion and politics, so we will continue this evening. Uh, for more information about our lecturers uh, or becoming a member, you can have a look at our website at www.john-adams.nl or you can have a look at our information stand. Uh, and we would be delighted if you uh, would become a member. Um, Mr. Chavan will be signing his books here on stage, and if you don't have a copy, you can buy a copy over there. Um, and you are welcome to have a drink uh, outside in the bar. Thank you 